This is Bo from legionpodcasts.com. Hey, it's been a crazy time, and when the world gets nuts, we're happy to offer some old-fashioned podcast entertainment. But for some folks, getting a laugh out of a show isn't really helping these days. People who depend on tips in their bartending jobs or have been put on furlough with no pay till the worst of this coronavirus threat has passed. That's a tough spot. That's why we set up a GoFundMe for members of our community, a sort of grand scale, take a penny, leave a penny. For people like myself, for whom the recent disruptions haven't kicked us out of work, well, we can drop a few of those extra pennies in the GoFundMe jar. For those who are directly affected by recent events and find themselves looking for money to pay the electric bill or keep the water on, well, how about you give me a shout at bo, B-O, at legionpodcasts.com. Let me know the situation and what you need, and we'll do our best to make life a little easier. And you can find links to the GoFundMe on the front page of legionpodcasts.com, on our Facebook group page, or on Twitter at Legion Podcasts, where it's the pinned tweet. For those of you who are able, thanks in advance for chipping in. And members of our community who need a hand, hey, here we are. Remember, stay safe, stay healthy, and we're all going to get through this together. Legion isn't just a name, it's who we are. Thanks for listening to all the shows here on Legion Podcasts, and we'll talk to you soon. Oh, that's disgusting. Oh, yeah, that's Archfoot. It's tidy. Oh, man. He had small feet. Yeah, everything. Yeah, well, he had a big oh. dick. He had a big dick. <laughs> Hopefully, oh. you'll find that next. Drop it. Duncan and both come correct. So let, let's just dive in here, Duncan. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Hey, welcome to a new episode of Duncan and Bo Come Correct. <laughs> I hate when it does that. I, just... It's just how it goes, Duncan. Um, <laughs> so in our new outbreak style society, Duncan. Yes, that has happened since the last time. We're this is what happens when we go monthly. The world falls apart. Yeah, yeah. Who knew that we were the, the hinge upon which the world turned? <laughs> it's a dangerous danger. For historical purposes, perhaps, when, you know, the aliens find this. <laughs> There's nothing left but buildings, cockroaches in this podcast. Oh, if only, Duncan. <laughs> that would truly be a legacy uh, for a species. But, <laughs> but yeah, so since we left, um, the uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, has become a, a pandemic, has spread across the globe. Mm-hmm. Um, societies are doing their level best to contain uh, the virus mm-hmm. and have have levied restrictions. Um, I, I and I say that because I'm genuinely curious. I, I I keep up, but there's so much news coming so fast. It's genuinely difficult to keep up with where countries are in the grand scheme of things. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, Italy seems to be the hardest hit right now. Yeah, but it's got, I mean, very much like Japan was at the start as well. It's got, I mean, in terms of population age, um, Italy's population age, because of their diet, believe it or not, it means that people regularly live well past their 80s into their 90s. So, I mean, I think that was always a given. I think uh, Japan also had relatively a high kind of death count early on as well because they have a very similar situation uh, because of their, their national diet. They tend to live a lot longer. So, um, and what we found out is uh, COVID-19 turns out to be um, particularly lethal to those of, of, of a certain age and above or people with respiratory problems. So yeah, I mean, that didn't surprise me. Also Italy in classic Italian stereotypical fashion really didn't give a fuck when it first landed. They were just like, yeah, <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just keep doing things. Uh, we'll just still have gi- giant family get-togethers and whatnot. And now they are basically the poster nation for don't do what we did. I mean, we- nobody's listening. Yeah, well, of course. Well, they are. They're just maybe maybe um, not listening quick enough. Yeah. So uh, I think in terms of Italy's response was very, very slow. The rest of the world is marginally so where is where is Scotland in all this? Obviously, I, li- I watched that Nicola Sturgeon, um, uh, her press release or, or her yeah. speech, and you know, again, I'm always jealous of competent and in, you know empathetic leadership uh, at any time. Well, if you listen to her her speaking in comparison to someone even like Boris Johnson, it's eloquent. It's you know it it has a a, a sense of humor to it, um, but at the same point, it, it 
details a very serious message and the steps that are being taken by the government and that you should take as conscientious citizens uh, to try and help not only the health service but your your fellow neighbours and uh, fellow citizens. So I think she 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 did it perfectly. That's that's what you need. You need a bit of reassurance um, and also just. You don't need scaremongering. You don't. Need, you just need to be told exactly. The, the thing is, the, like you say, the details are changing on a day to day basis um, as more information is coming out. No one really knows the scale because tests are not being carried out as frequently, regardless where you live in the world. Tests are not being carried out on the level that they should be. So as a result of that, whatever whatever confirmed case number you're hearing is a fraction of probably what is out there. Um, so, as it stands just now, the the UK was, some people have criticised, maybe slow to act. I don't necessarily think they have been, actually, I think, from a Westminster point of view, and it, it does pain me to say this, um, they've probably done things on the right scale at the right time. Schools officially closed on Friday throughout the UK, so that's them closed for essentially six months. They won't start back up until a brand new year now in August. The notes went out last night, restaurants, pubs, gyms um, and large place social gatherings are now closed. So that's that's not going to happen. And um, RGs not to panic by, uh, essentially, are the, are the big things at the moment. If you feel like you're coming down with the symptoms that they suggest, you should phone kind of the local NHS health numbers for guidance. But for the most point, you should kind of self-isolate yourself and your family for 14 days um, and work from home where possible. And that's kind of where we're at at the moment. Uh, the government's just announced a massive stimulus package for those that are displaced with work. And yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of where we are just now. Um, I will say this, if uh, social outrage was a cure, America would be, <laughs> would be COVID free. Like you guys are still at each other's throats. And uh, that is not the that is not the way to do things. The way to do things is Voltron up, um, you, you know, just disregard what your government's saying and just use common sense. No, oh, uh, and, that's never and you been guys, our strength. Yeah, that, you guys will be fine. You guys will be fine. That's all you need to do is just don't listen to what your government's saying at the moment because I've tried listening to a couple of those press conferences and you know the the order of the day is dumb, even dumber. Um, I, I just don't like, like there was that clip uh, making the rounds yesterday, which kind of time dates where we are just now of uh, that that health health minister or whatever he was, you know, your general surgeon. General, oh, I don't yeah, know Fauci, what he the, 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 the like one of the experts in the situation. Yeah, yeah, like the 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 the, the face palm hair of the world, uh, which is kind of. <laughs> which is kind of amazing like see if you see a british press conference like everyone is reading from the same hymn sheet everything is you know is is uniform and it's approach uh to stop confusion and then you've got trump going off and this guy's just like oh fuck <laughs> you can actually, yeah i think you can see your mouth the words oh fuck um as his hand slid over his forehead so he is yeah been, just like that guy dr fauci has been the one beacon in all of this. Mm -hmm. Like any interview he's done, any any press uh, uh, press uh, briefing that he's he's been in front of, it's always very reasonable. It's just like here's what's going on. Here's what we need to do. You know, we need to close down the bars and restaurants and and whatever means you get people out of those places. That's what needs to be done. Everybody, you know, like he's very. He's very matter of fact. He's a scientist. He's like, here's yeah. the science. Here's what we would need to do to combat the spread of this virus. And all that is is sort of undone by an administration that seems far more concerned with the appearance of of yeah. their uh, sort of their their handling of the situation, um, which hasn't been handled. You know, like they kicked the can as long as they could. And even now, because the United States is, in fact, a bunch of states, um, the the political move seems to be we are going to put the states in charge. Yeah. And, and that way, if shit goes bad, the gov the federal government is not to blame. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I mean, he said it himself. Uh, like, somebody asked him, uh, like who do you uh, it, do you do you bear any responsibility for any of this? And he was very quick to say, like, oh, I'm not to blame. Yeah, yeah, of course. But, but I think the the thing is as well is the more information is 
coming out as well. And the, the weird thing about it is that information has been known for not only months, but has been known since last year. And I think the more we're finding out about specifically the the specifically the the tracking patterns and how people are dealing with it or not dealing with it at the same time, uh, I think there needs to be some uniform approach. Like your country is like it's so different in terms of landmass, climate, and all the rest. You know what I mean? That you can't just have a one blanket, one rule fits all. It's different in Scotland, right? Scotland has a population of five million. You know what I mean? You know, like, like I think maybe one of your smallest states has about the same population, if not bigger than Scotland, right? And for the most part, you you want to like blanket put out something across this. It's fairly easy to do when you're dealing with like rural states um, where people live fairly remote and, and kind of distant. Like, you can't treat that the same way as you would treat New York, for example. So I, I think there, there is a difficulty there, which is all the more reason to make sure your message is on point. Yeah, like you can't you can't just give out a one size fits all approach um, to 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 kind of public messaging on on something as serious as this. It has to be tailored. It has to fit specific, um, not only specific states but specific areas and. Yeah, that's the one thing that's not like the it, it wasn't me, it was him sort of kind of finger pointing, uh, you know, that's a silly question or that's an ignorant question to say to a journalist does not inspire confidence on anything. And it's weird, like of all the of all the things that we've spoken about in the four years that Trump has been here, that, let that sink in, four years that Trump has been your president. Oh, did you ever think it would be a global pandemic that might be the thing that gets people going, I don't think this guy's presidential. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he had been very lucky in that there hadn't been a a, a political or, or you know, more uh, tangible threat to the country other than those of his own making. I was about to say he survived through large-scale natural disease where he has completely fucked up the response you know what I mean? Completely fucked up the response. Um, he survived through all of that. And w I mean, <laughs> like he kind of uh, aggressive strain of the flu is what might get people now saying, actually, I don't think this guy's cut out for the job. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, I don't, you know, like you have to get into kind of the nitty gritty of of the politics of it to see how how truly incompetent he is. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, most people aren't paying attention to the fact. Like, yes, he is saying I am putting the states in charge of, of handling the the epidemic as they see fit. But what you don't hear accompanying that is he is also. Uh, trying to undercut the funding, the additional funding to states, mm -hmm. so that you're, he's basically saying, I want them all to take care of this themselves, but I'm not going to offer any federal financial or practical aid to help with that. Yeah. And, and so again, it's a mixed message of, Hey, they need to take care of it, but we're not going to help. And he made some statement like when when a bunch of governors were like, "Hey, we need ventilators because like once this thing gets bad here, we're gonna we we don't have it. Like you know, our medical system is a for profit system. Empty beds do not make money, and so we yeah. don't have any empty beds. And then if there's a sudden inrush of uh of of these COVID patients, it's gonna overwhelm everything. Like they're already calling." Uh, a lot of nurses and doctors out of retirement to. Oh yeah, they're doing this. the same here. Yeah, they're do they're doing the same here. I I was listening to um, Slate do a podcast called What's Next. It's usually I like listening to it. You get it's like comes out every morning. It's about twenty minutes, and they just talk about a subject that's pertinent on that day. And um, they were speaking to someone in Italy who had said that basically ambulances have stopped using their sirens because it, they were they were coming that frequently. During the day and nighttime, it was distressing the members of the public. I mean, let that sink in. Yeah, that's how gr that's how grim things are. Is the actual sound of like ambulance sirens going at all hours and, and consistent, um, consistently throughout the day is giving people a conversion of kind of PTSD. 
yeah. which is just insane. Um, what about, are you working from home? Are you? Yeah, my company's um, pretty much disbanded to everyone working from home. I am fortunate, kind of like yourself in that. And I, I genuinely feel for people that are not in the position that I am afforded, which is I do a job in kind of software and tech. So my my work can be done pretty much anywhere. I don't actually need to be in an office and with things like Skype and, you know, um, Teams and Slack these days, you don't actually physically need to be in the same room with people to get shit done. So um, my my work is kind of, oh, everyone's working from home, but the the kind of the kind of opening statement on that was talking about months rather than weeks. So I, I genuinely expect to be home working now till at least June, maybe even longer. Um, the government seem, you know, they can curtail the, the kind of larger part of the curve um, for about twelve weeks. So I think it's probably going to take a bit longer than that. So uh, yeah, to, so I'm, I'm working from home. My wife is still commuting into her office at the moment, although they've changed the way the trains are now running. Uh, they're now running what's called a Sunday service over here. I don't know if you have something equivalent in the oh yeah, it's in, what religious services. Yeah, so like, so like Sunday service in the UK is basically like if you were having four trains running an hour to a city on a Saturday, it'll be one an hour. So that's kind of that's now happening uh, universally. So everything's now Sunday service, and um, I don't know how long that's going to be before her work tells her to work from home as well. So. Uh, and my daughter's just finished up school, which I feel gutted for her because she's she's primary. She was primary one, so this is her first year at school, and she's not had a full year at school. And she loves her school and her friends and all the rest. And you know, it's happened. I mean, I mean, it's all the small things we take. Like as an adult, you can put a practical mind on it, but as a five year old, to try and wrap your head around right school was running now, school isn't running. Um, no, you can't spend time with your friends, know the birthday party that you were going to have isn't happening anymore, know you, the holiday that you were going on isn't happening anymore. Just this chain reaction and all sank in, in basically one conversation with her and to see to see that's kind of heartbreaking. But like she doesn't understand what a, a global pandemic is. She doesn't understand the importance of that. So I'm trying to bring it down to that level is, is really important. And that's why like um, Nicola Sturgeon raving about how great our first minister is uh, and i'm not just saying that because I, I voted for her party i just genuinely think as a, a leader's response is a great response yeah. um it was aimed at not just adults but like she she directly mentioned children and that remember was... do your homework it's, it's yeah. at that level it's at a family level and that's important i think it's because it's affecting everyone and kids are online and like my daughter knows what corona is she doesn't know what corona is but she knows what the term coronavirus is so without any context so kind of alleviating some of that through a, a general frank discussion i think is is very important but yeah i've been lucky i know you're kind of similar but aren't you you're working from home yeah i mean the business i'm in is uh built around the hospitality industry mm, oh uh, fuck so you know that yes we are working from home um it, depending on how how long things go that could uh, affect our company um uh pretty directly mm. for for right now everything is fine like you know uh here in in Tennessee uh, or at least Nashville um they have made all the bars and they've essentially closed the 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 bars downtown which mm -hmm. were the big tourist spot and even though after after they initially were like, hey, everybody needs to stay out of bars, there were a lot of pictures circulating from that weekend of people like going to the bars and packing the places and being yeah. like, woo, look at this. Who, fuck you, virus. We're going to have a good time. And you're yeah, like, I saw oh. that, um, I saw that uh, spring break stuff. Yeah, you're which... just like, come on, man. I'm like, I, w I actually wish it killed off people in that age range and not old people because if ever there was a <laughs> if ever there was a pull of people to eradicate now is you know I mean it's that it's that sort of level I just don't I just don't get it yeah but have. but so they they've shut down everything but uh takeout and uh delivery from yeah. all the restaurants here 
Um, so, you know, we're seeing that wave, like recently California and Illinois and Connecticut just completely locked down, New York locked down. Um, so we'll see, you know, I don't think Tennessee will get there because aside from Nashville and Memphis and Knoxville, everything's fairly rural. Yeah. Um, so even where I am, there's not, you know, we've had, I think three cases so far as of today. Uh, Mm -hmm. three confirmed cases and you know they've closed schools and stuff like that uh i think you can still sit down in a restaurant here but i haven't tried um you know i'm like look man i i have to admit when people have been posting stories about like i don't know what i'm doing man i've been in my house for a week and i'm going fucking crazy and i'm like this is the best life i've ever lived (laughs) i'm finally and i'm like i'm not not busy you know i'm sure you find this too where you'll you'll hear people be like i don't know what to do with myself and you're just like hey man this is i i've still got a backlog i've still got a show to edit i'm Mm -hmm. recording two more uh you know like i've got plenty of stuff to keep me occupied in fact i wish i could take a vacation from this outbreak (laughs) it's weird how like years of podcasting us have years of podcasting have essentially given us the tools equipped to deal with a global pandemic you know yeah. What I mean? <laughs> yeah, no, my, my the best life for me is never leaving. And uh, well, this it, is the thing I'm thinking about, like, like after I've worked from home for three months, do I want to go back to working in an office? You know, so here's the interesting thing. Like, you know, uh, let's put a button on. Yes, the pandemic is scary. Everybody's uh, freaking out about it a little bit, but uh, we're probably going to be okay. So everybody, also, everybody chill. Yeah. Also, what I would say is, Myself and Bo both have online presences. If you feel yourself needing to talk at all yeah. as a listener of this show, drop us a line. I'd like, Please, I'd, yes, yeah, yeah. Don't don't suffer in silence. Don't feel your sanity going a bit crazy. If you want to have, even if it's the most absurdest question at all, you know, like what, like I, I posed a recent question on my show. Like, what's it? This Bo, could you imagine? Right? Could you imagine David Lynch? directing the movie shocker oh my wouldn't god wouldn't that have been the greatest thing that, that came to me on on thursday on a whim when someone said if david lynch directed a horror movie what, what what horror movie would you like to see and i was like shocker like things coming in and out of electricity sockets why did david lynch not direct that <laughs> it's all about power <laughs> like but like stuff like that even if it's the most absurdest question you can think of and you want to have a silly conversation we're both online. We, we might not get because of time differences. We might not get back to you straight away, but don't suffer in silence. Drop us a line. Yeah, and uh, and, and we'll, I'll I'll tell you what we'll we'll come back around to that here in a second. But talking mm. about this working from home thing, I was talking to my boss, like the owner of our company, uh, shortly before we all had to go to remote. You know, like and again, like you, we're uniquely suited where most of our work is. Online, like yesterday, I did my first like online training session with a customer and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. And it's like, oh, this is all totally doable. And the thing that it revealed, uh, which, all right, so here's the weird thing, is about a week before the coronavirus shit hit, there was a tornado in Nashville Mm -hmm. that hit the building where I work. And it just leveled the neighborhood uh, that, that the business is in. Um, Our building fared better than most in the fact that it was still habitable after the tornado. Uh, Across the street, that was not the case. It was really something to see. It looked like a a war zone. It was crazy. So because of that, we were forced to work remotely a little bit because the building had no power, nor was it going to for a few days. Mm -hmm. And so we started working from home there. And it went well. Like From the first day that it happened, Like we were up and running in about four hours. And then uh, we worked from home, came back, and then the coronavirus thing happened, and, and we started to work from home again. And this conversation I had with my boss was it, basically him saying, "There is what we have learned is there is little reason to have our company centralized like this." Yeah, of course, of course. In today's in today's world, you don't need like my my boss is very old school, and his approach where he just likes everyone in an office that I can just go and grab someone and wants to speak to him. But I genuinely feel his arguments, his antiquated arguments of, well, we need a support phone, you know, a phone that people, our customers can phone. Like, and so someone has to be in the office to answer. Like all those things that he's raised as issues not to have staff working 
um, like remotely without having to pay the overhead of like rental cost. I think that all that's going away. You know, I, I, yeah. all those arguments will be slowly picked off as long as we can still deliver the same quality and the same uh, currency of of support that we have been doing. And then beyond that, if all we need is the occasional day for meetings for the company and all the rest, you can you can get like a WeWork style, you know, office for a day sort of thing where you get everyone in. For, for a meeting or whatever, catch up as a company or a business, and then everyone goes back to working at home. Yeah. I think a lot of the paradigms, that was that was my kind of point on my Thursday show, is a lot of the paradigms that we live under or have been living under are like remnants of certain parts of the way we conduct ourselves, where, it, where it's commercially or socially. I think those are are being highlighted as kind of old-fashioned. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of them will slowly now start to slip away and kind of post uh, COVID nineteen. I think the world looks looks different. It looks a, a, a lot different in the way we embrace certain aspects of technology, which have only ever really went so far or certain levels of professional industry. I think they they become just everyday tools, and I'm not against that to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of like the, if the tech's out there and it works and it does a job and it allows you to communicate and and still live and still be and and whatnot, then why are we not embracing them? Yeah, I mean it it increases uh, statistically speaking. If you are working from home, you tend to be more productive and happier. I work longer. Like I've, yeah, I've, I've I do too. This, yeah, where, where like at half past five, if I have to go and pick up my daughter, and I'm like, right, that's me finished, and I'm not going to look at my computer again. Like at half five, if she's already here and I'm in the middle of processing something, I'm like, that might as well just finish processing yeah. it. I'll free up some time tomorrow. Knowing fine well that I'll probably do more tomorrow anyway. Like my day, my working days are longer, but I don't feel like I'm doing more work. If that makes any sense. Yeah, and I I tend to start a little earlier just because I'm like, oh, I've, I've had my shower, I got dressed, I had my coffee. Now I'm ready to sit down and do some work. I mean, it's about 30, 45 minutes before I would normally start, but why not? Yep. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, yeah, I, I agree. And I think, you know, in, be, despite all the chaos and craziness and stuff like that going on in the world, and there's definitely going to be some more pain in the future before uh, the oh, relief God, yeah. begins. Mm-hmm. But th- on the other side of this, we might be looking at, for a certain segment of the working population, there might actually be some improvements. And one would hope, even in other industries, places like the hospitality and enter- entertainment industries, that it, it teaches a lesson of like, oh, we need some kind of rainy day fund, whether that happens yeah. on a governmental I mean, level or on a business level or whatever. See all these large, like all the large, large, not not your local kind of, your restaurants and your, your stores and whatnot, but see like companies like Boeing, See the fact that Boeing doesn't have a rainy day fund, Man. as some description. Like if you if you are predicated your entire industry on nothing bad is going to happen that's going to stop people taking flights, then you are an idiot. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, I mean, come on. <laughs> when all right, so this is what stuck in my crawl recently, and this is again, this is getting into the political weeds a little bit. Mm-hmm. But so in 08, the the airlines were like, "We need a bailout. We're going to fail." Yeah, and so the government gave them billions of dollars so that the the airline industry in the United States did not collapse. Mm-hmm. And what they did with that money is they bought back shares of their own stocks to bolster their own profit lines. Yeah, pay up bonuses, right? And then this hits, and they're like, "You guys are never going to believe this. <laughs> we don't have any money." <laughs> It's fucking unreal. It's unreal. And the thing uh, is, yeah. they're going to get the money again. Nobody I know. But a lesson. I have the Star Trek VI Kirk reaction of let <laughs> them die. You know, like, yes, it will suck for about two months. And then some other airline will, will you know, rise from the ashes. Yeah. And will be okay again. But I, I'm a firm believer that at some point you just gotta, you know, pull the the teat out of the mouth. But isn't it? But this is the thing that that makes me smile so much about these things is, isn't this the whole premise that capitalism is built on? Yes. The strong survive, right. and the weak disappear. Yes. And you I mean if you're going the other way, where bailouts 
you're basically enacting socialism. Like you're basically yeah. saying public money must rescue this company. So put them under public ownership then. I'd like and this is the I, I I find it so amusing that you like the you could well on the one hand you can have people talking about the Oh, yeah, this is the this is the purpose of the market. The market means that you know the strong survive and the the, the weak and and not needed services disappear and everyone gets what they want and all the rest. That is not how system the system is set up at all. It hasn't been set up that way for a long fucking time. It's so yeah, it's crazy. The it's it, it is one of those things where like a, a mom and pop restaurant that's suffering right now is less likely to get the help that they need than mm-hmm. a multi-billion dollar company that should have fucking well knew better. Oh, yeah. And yeah. And, and that's the thing that frustrates me as as a citizen, as a human being, that there is no humanity in this system. And mm-hmm. and that's another thing I think we're learning. Um, a, a, another, you know, a short 12 years later, we are learning that <laughs> uh, once again, you know, it is, it is corporations who are going to get the bailouts, not the people. Yeah. And anyway, it's for sure. But but again, to end this on a positive note, because we've been talking about a lot of heavy shit and whatnot, um, as Duncan said, look, uh, you can find me on, on Twitter at Legion Podcast. You can certainly find me on Facebook. There's the Legion Podcast stuff all over the place there. Um, you know, the, you can reach me at Bo, B-O at Legion Podcasts dot com. Uh, the, like Duncan said, if you got a problem, uh, yo, I'll solve it. <laughs> no, you did not. No, you did not. <laughs> and, I bought the mission bow, Randall. <laughs> I, I ask you humbly to check out the record while the DJ revolves it. But you can, yeah, you can. I reach always out. wonder what happened to it. I always wonder what happened to Vanilla Ice. Didn't realize I was podcasting with him. Yeah, uh, the, uh, what, what's his name? Robert Van Winkle. Or something, yeah, yeah. That was a good change to vanilla ice, by the way. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's certainly an improvement. Um, the other thing I would mention here, in addition to reaching out for more vanilla ice, uh, because <laughs> I can go deeper. Um, but I've seen uh, cool as ice. Uh, oh, that is dear. not true. I've never seen cool as ice, but <laughs> I should. Know. But you uh. Should. uh but no, also, if you go to our uh, either the Twitter or the Facebook or even legionpodcasts.com, um, you will see there a link to a GoFundMe. Mm-hmm. And here's here's the thing. Um, as, as Duncan mentioned, like I'm doing I'm doing fine here, which is not how a lot of people are doing. So uh, we we set up a GoFundMe for Legion podcast listeners and hosts or whoever whoever needs a little help right now. Maybe you don't need help right now, but you will in a month. Um, we've got eh, you know a few hundred bucks in the account right now um, that continues to grow. I will I will certainly continue to contribute. And all I would ask is that if you are trying to make the tough decision of how do I keep the lights on? How do I keep the water turned on? How do I pay for groceries? Um, give me a yell at any of those locations. And and the reason that we are doing this GoFundMe is so that uh, we provide a, the safety net that we can. Um, and, and if you're in my position or Duncan's position where you're kind of doing okay during all this, uh, feel free to throw some money in. Uh, again, I'm, I'm a, of the mind that you know, we we are all in this together, and uh, you are certainly under no obligation to do either of those things. But uh, if either you need help or would like to give some help, there is a place you can do it. Well said. Yeah. So uh, let's let's swing to levity. <laughs> yes. Let, let's move away from that. And and Duncan, let's see mm-hmm. how all this works because uh, people came out of the fucking woodwork. Oh dear. And. I'm going to try something real stupid. Uh, this is not the first time, ladies and gentlemen, that Bo Ransdell has said this, and I'll let you know every other time you've never heard the fruit of this. <laughs> <All right. laughs> <cut out. laughs> so we have, for a long time, taken questions from our audience. Yes. And um, <laughs> in some cases, uh, they have been deep questions. Some cases, they have been silly questions. But it's about time that we turned the tables. Mm-hmm. And so with us now 
is a selection of listeners. Uh, I believe uh, the the titular witch from the Witch versus the Doomsday Clock is with us right now. Is that the case? That is the case, Mister Ransdell. Good evening. Uh, good morning. <laughs> good morning, or good afternoon, or good night. I don't know. <laughs> Um, we, we might in fact have another guest join us. Um, but suspense is killing me. Yes. Mm. So, uh, we will take that as it comes. Here's the deal. As I've said, we have a, a number of people, uh, who have asked us questions over the years. We said, fuck that. It, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Nice. And so now... Uh, we are going to present to the witch and anyone else who shows up. There are a couple of people who may jump in here, uh, but we'll start with you. Um, a series of questions, five questions from me, five questions from Duncan that you uh, are required to answer. This sounds like a surprise proctology exam. <laughs> well, there goes my first question. <laughs> Don't, yeah, don't that's, 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 that's one thing you don't want to want to hear in our proctology exam is what is this? Okay, our, also <laughs> also with us is Derek. So we have uh, we now have two faithful listeners. Uh, this is Derek and and the witch uh, who are going to be answering questions devised by Duncan and myself mm-hmm. uh, to tax the mind and the spirit in in okay. these troubling times. So Duncan, if you would like to begin. Uh, ask a question of our listeners. Okay, Derek and the Witch. If you had started a social media platform similar to Facebook, what would you have called it to the Witch first? I think called it Look Face. Look, <laughs> look Face. All right. Noted. Look face. Kept, Just yep. Look Face. Look Face. Look Face. That's right. Yeah, I, I like there it. you go. See? <laughs> Easy, simple, direct. Same, like question, same question to Derek. Uh, if it's anything like it is today, curb stomp. <laughs> oh, <God>. oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> curb stomp is aggressive. Dot <laughs> com. I was like, look, imagine put your like going out for avocado and toast. I'll post it on my curb stomp In, instead of a a little thumbs up symbol. It's just an oi. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, instead instead of a dislike, it's just like some dislodged teeth. <laughs> yeah, right. It, it is just any scene from Romper Stomper. Yeah, it's, you don't you don't give a poke on it to, to wake someone up. You give someone a gummer. <laughs> oh wow, that's right. I went there, Bo Rans. Though, what's your question? All right, uh, let's begin this time with Derek first. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Ooh, Bo Rans. Though, coming. Yeah, I'm I'm throwing the heat. Well, I actually have had a hot dog in a sandwich roll, so it could be a sandwich in some points. It's yes or no, Derek. <laughs> Don't fuck yeah. around here. <laughs> Specify that in the start. You, just say this is a yes or no. you left it open. I, look, it, it's a yes or no. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Okay, the witch. Fuck no. You Americans and your obsession with calling everything a sandwich. A sandwich really? is two bits of bread. All right? That's it. That's the... That- the transferred British mentality all the way over in Australia. That's what we do in the Commonwealth. I can universally look, acknowledge what a sandwich is. Call me a European. <laughs> I agree. I think a hot dog is a hot dog. A sandwich is a sandwich. I, I think a hot dog nice. requires that there's a pocket of bread holding the meat. Yeah. Uh, mm. ah, but therefore, you could put a hot dog in a pita bread and it would still be a hot dog. I don't disagree with that. <laughs> And also, it's not really like a hot dog is the thing that's going in the bun, just like a burger mm. is the thing that goes in the bun. So, mm. right. But if you had a hamburger stuffed into a hot dog bun, you wouldn't call it a hamburger anymore. The, well, well, you only would because it's a hamburger. Yeah, because it's a hamburger. The only thing that it's, not, it's not sausage shaped. A hot, and see, there's a difference <laughs> between a hot dog and a sausage. But what if you, what if you just brown the ground beef, like it's loose ground beef, and you dump that in a hot dog bun? Put some relish on it. It still ain't a hot dog. That and sounds delicious. Like though, I, still, I, I wouldn't munch the show. That that sounds amazing. It, it, but the it thing sounds is, like a lazy man's taco. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the thing is, though, if I can uh, excuse my language, but uh, a hot dog is pretty much a miniature bologna stick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when you have sliced bologna and you have fried bologna, 
it tastes like a grilled hot dog still. It's the same. All right, and here's here's the real curveball. I did not realize is... that Bo was going to ask a question that has instantly made my stomach think that everything sounds delicious. <laughs> well, that's what I do. But the the real fucked up thing is when somebody takes a couple of hot dogs and slices them in half and puts that between two slices of bread. I don't even know what you call that shit. That's a fucking sandwich, bro. It yeah, sure sounds just, like yeah. it. Like, yeah, it's a sandwich. We just told you between two bits of bread, it's a sandwich. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's why that's why it kind of occurred to me to say yes because I did have a hot dog that way before. Uh, there you go. Yeah, all right. And you, what you do is you put mustard on one side and cream cheese on the other, and you stack oh. it with potato chips and it's and sauce, and it's fantastic. Oh, which I'm coming to love with you. <laughs> you finally, that's things get that. sexy on this show. <laughs> so you two can have a body I'm like having, mine, Duncan. I'm, I'm, ha- I'm having flashbacks when Burger King used to have their enormous omelet sandwich. This is the first time. Yeah, Bur- man, Burger King's like, motto should literally. just be like, "We don't give a shit." <laughs> For real. Yeah, if you can keep him down, it's good. Yeah, yeah but Burger King's motto should be, "You came in here, <laughs> right? We, no one made you." No, Burger King is basically Burger King, and a lot of American food, fast food, like establishments. Are basically eateries like from the mindset of the person that built the pinhead box. You know what I mean? Yep. <laughs> it's like you you opened the door, we made. You know what I mean? Like, like, <laughs> like that's, what, that's what it is. You it turned is. on the griddle, we came. <laughs> yeah. For real. Is. Love it. Love uh, it. Right. Is it is yes, it's your turn. Question? Yes. Ooh, now, hang on. Before we go, I've yes. got to give you a fun fact about Burger King. Please. Mm-hmm. In Australia, Burger King is called Hungry Jack's. Oh, it's not Burger King Prime Minister or uh, Prime Minister King or Prime Minister Burger. <laughs> no, Burger no Prime it, it's not Big Prime Minister. It's called Hungry Jacks. Really? <laughs> and, <laughs> is their motto still "We don't give a shit"? <laughs> yeah, it, it's actually "We didn't wash our hands." <laughs> oh. <laughs> we will put the virus in you too soon. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, Doug, Doug, and what's another question for these fine gentlemen? People that show. Sure. Every single holiday photo they have to their friends and family post their vacation trip. Public service or psychotic? Cunts. <laughs> no, public service or psychotic? Oh, sorry. <laughs> public service uh, or psychotic? So- Derek, psychotic. Completely fucking like psychotic. psychotic. Derek, what do you think? I think it goes psychotic. No, right, right. That's that's noted, and I will delete the folder with my holiday snaps. Can, cool. can I give you. you a little life advice here? Uh, <laughs> So what I do... You don't usually ask me before you berate me, though. I was going to tell you anyway. I was Is more because we've got guests? Yes. You, you, you brush it off. It was more of a rhetorical fancy. device than it was a legitimate question. So <laughs> so here is my rule. And I have, I have had this rule long enough that everyone knows it about me. And, and that's the thing. You have to be consistent with it. Mm-hmm. Is if anyone says, I want to show you pictures of my new kid, my vacation, my asshole, whatever it is that they want to show you pictures of... <laughs> You say it's a bit out of order normally. <laughs> I, Usually, yeah. I work with a, a lot of sodomites, but <laughs> <laughs> you can tell by the t-shirts they wear. <laughs> I heart sodomy, they say. And <laughs> I went to the land and all I got was sodomized. Yeah, yeah. I went to the Boy Scout jamboree. I went to mass. Um, sorry. So, but what I do is if anyone asks me if I, if I want to see their, their, uh, holiday pictures, whatever it is, I say, show me your best six. I only want to see six of them and show me your best six. And I reserve Mm -hmm. the right to ask for more. If it's interesting, that has never happened. It seems weirdly like you've just promoted one of your shows. (laughs) No, no, no. (laughs) That 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 was such a... Like six movies. Pick, pick, pick six? Oh, is that basically what you're saying? Did you just find a way to plug one of your shows on this very serious question and answer session with our listeners? I didn't find a way, but you sure did. I appreciate Life it. Life finds a way, Bo. Life finds a way. Uh, <laughs> you, you were so busy wondering if you could advertise the show, you didn't stop to ask if you should. <laughs> Just show me pictures of your dogs. That's all I care about. See, yeah. this is like Derek. I made Derek's week. Yeah. Yeah, like pet pictures are are the one thing I will I will genuinely want to see more of. Yes, but yeah. For if, first of all, if you've got a newborn baby, I do not want to see that thing. <laughs> 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 
that is a, that is an ugly little piece of flesh, and until it's talking, I don't want any part of it. Oh no, even then, Bo. <laughs> until it can lend me twenty bucks, I'm not interested. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Until you're on the road and potentially a threat to me, I don't need to know you're alive. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I and and as far as vacation pictures, I had a friend of mine show me a picture one time of a a menu that they ordered from when they were in Cozumel. What? Yeah, I was like, are you <laughs> took? First of all, you took a picture of the menu, and then you had the sheer gall, the the fucking balls to show another <laughs> the human fucking being. Fucking balls on this guy. <laughs> <laughs> the fucking balls to show me a picture of a menu that you ordered from on vacation. You can go right to hell with that let, shit. Let me count it because I have a photo of a menu that I took right in Tokyo, and the menu was the golden shower menu. All right, fine, like, fine. And no see, fucker is going to believe this. So yeah. I, you do it for comical value. You don't do it. See, on on the Thursday we went to the Outback Steak, and this is our menu. You don't do it that way. You yeah. do it for comedic effect only to show people they had dick soup. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. I had shark ball soup. Here's my photographic evidence. Which what's, what's the pineapple special detail? On that golden shower menu, <laughs> you do not want to know. <laughs> is it my turn? Yes. Oh, okay. So, uh, qu- question two. Holy shit. Question two. If animals could talk, who would be the asshole of the animal kingdom? Oh, nice question, Borat. Thank you very much. Who's it? Who's it oh, let's uh, let's start with uh, the witch this time. Uh, me cats. <laughs> really? They seem so friendly. <laughs> Those little fuck. But they're into everything. They fucking gotta look at everything. What's going on? What are you doing? What the fuck are you doing? Did you see what he was doing? Oh my fucking god! Did you see? He had his sneak out. Oh my fucking god! Did you see? did you see the pants that she was wearing? Oh my fucking god! Just a little horde of assholes. So they're yeah. the the Stephen Baldwin from Sliver of the Animal Kingdom. I was gonna I was I was gonna see the the the, 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 the gawker of the Animal Kingdom, aren't they? Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, fuck me, cats. <laughs> Derek. Why why isn't the asshole of the animal kingdom meerkats? Because it's penguins, because they always look like they're <laughs> fucking pissed off. <laughs> they do look like they got a real core cob up their ass. I'm just yeah, picturing all seriously, of... if you were dragging your dick in the snow all the time, you'd be pissed off. I just I just picture every penguin just talking like Danny DeVito too. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want in my life. <laughs> Old <laughs> Danny DeVito from Twins tonight is your night. Oh, it's your night, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of more of the uh, Always Sunny DeVito, where you just have a bunch yeah. of penguins like, we don't have a lot of years left. We're going to get real weird with them. Let's play Nightcrawlers. <laughs> right. <laughs> They've always got a gun and willing to wave it around. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I, uh, both of those are perfectly acceptable answers. Duncan, I am satisfied. How about a question from you? Right, my question will go to the witch first for this one. Two-day-old pizza, food of the gods, or spawn of Satan? Pizza, full stop. Cold, warm. Uh, anything, as long as it hasn't actually got stuff growing on it, it is absolute ambrosia. There we go. Nice. Same question to Eric. I would say yes. You know, I had to look at the pizza first when I do see it in the fridge because... Depends on where I got it. They got it from. Kind of picky <laughs> on pit places, of course, because you never know how much oil they drown that pizza in, mm. and then it gets crustacean on it. Mm-hmm. But you know, if it's two days old, I'll take a chance on it. There we go. So yeah, I'll but go. see, what what if it's got the Rona on it, right? Because the Rona can live in the fridge. You could be eating Rona pizza. <laughs> I asked for that as a part of my topping. I want I want some Roni and some Rona. Rona. Oh, you little sniffly one, sniffly one, <laughs> finding it hard to breathe with my corona. You got a fever, son. <laughs> oh, I love all this. So, I mean, here's the thing that I have a problem with uh, Duncan's question. Uh, oh, oh. Uh, a small detail. See, I don't pick holes in your questions at all. I just want clarification. In... Are, this... Are you see, when our listeners ask us questions, do we have the opportunity to get clarification? Bro? No, we just answer the fucking question. That's why this is so unique. That's why it's a good show. <laughs> and <laughs> my question is is the pizza refrigerated in those two days? 
No. Okay. See, that makes a Ooh, difference. Ooh, yeah. No, that makes a difference. Yeah. I've, I've lived in houses where they use the pizza as an ashtray. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is this is a pizza that has stayed in its box on a worktop or a kitchen top and untouched for two days. Is it food of the gods or is it fucking refrigerating pizza for? That how how big question. is your pizza that you you have to refrigerate? It's consumed within ten uh, within two days or not at all? No, because like, you get like a really fucking big one and you eat half of it. You chuck the other half in the box in the fridge and you eat it the next day. Yeah, that's so you're eating it the next day. You yeah, but even fridge, like, even two you? three days down the track, if it's in the fridge, I I, I you have children, Duncan. All right. Yes. Now, I have I also live children. in a cold country, I, so technically I don't need a fridge. <laughs> right. It's I, refrigerator level. I, I will not level. eat anything that is left on a bench because was, it could have been <laughs> spat on, licked, spilled on. I was about um, to say, could, like, I just realized. Have had a quick crack at it. I, said, I just realized that I'm speaking to people that live in more temperate climates. So, um, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe the fridge thing uh, is a, a better stand. Uh, I don't know, Duncan, because Boston's like, the apocalypse right now because it's oh, I was like, gonna say, yeah, you're Boston. That's right. Boston's kind of more, yeah, uh, it's more Scottish than or Irish actually. More Scottish the, the way, than the universe, yeah, the way the way uh, I describe Boston's like weather changes. Like uh, the stand-up comedian Lewis Black was like, I was in Boston one time and it was like raining, fucking snowing, and fucking hailing all at the same time. They don't even write that type of fucking weather in the fucking Bible. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right, I've got a question for you guys. Let's start with Derek. Uh, what is the strangest thing you've ever seen in someone else's house? Uh, I seen a guy petting a ferret, with no shirt on. Is that a euphemism? It was. It was very odd. It was just like <laughs> I was in like my buddy's house, and his friend was over in his underwear, and it was. I think it was like his cousin or something. He's kind of all, you know, he's one of those droopy, all fucked up kind of dudes. And he's like playing with it. And he takes his eye out. He had a glass eye. Oh, well, now this is getting good. <laughs> and fucking, it, it was just, you know, and then fucking playing with the ferret. And the ferret took the eye and he was chasing the fucking ferret around. <laughs> he took his fucking eye. You, ah, you fling wow. some Benny Hill music in the background of that, and this is the greatest skit that's ever happened. Yeah, I this, <laughs> I could not be happier about the answer to that question. Uh, which you, you had bought ferret? Honestly, yeah, look, that's... you got to bring the heat if you want to beat a ferret chasing a glass eye. <laughs> yeah, with a, a, a semi naked man that that is that's tough. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I I think probably uh, the only thing. That, that I could come close to that was uh, I, I I lived in a share house, as you know, most young adults do from time to time. And one of the guys that lived there was very secretive. Um, and he, he, he moved out not long after I moved in. And when he went to his new place, because he was going to live by himself, uh, which, as it turns out, because, you know, he said, come around, I'd have a few beers. And I thought, yeah, great, we'll go have a few beers. And we're hanging out. And um, so we're sitting out the back having a couple of beers. And I said, oh, where's the toilet? Because in typical fashion, I walked in, we went straight to the fridge, and then we went outside. I didn't get a tour of the house that he lived in. It was just like, <clears throat> we're here to drink beer. And he said, just go down, just go in through the back door, turn left, and it's second door on the left. And I thought, no, that's easy. I can remember it. And it, I got as far as the toilet, and this is it's the end of the corridor. There's a toilet door on my left, and there's a door straight in front of me that's slightly ajar. <laughs> now, every part of me said, Don't open that door. Do not, under any circumstances, open that door. I did. Um, the floor was covered in garbage bags taped to the carpet, like black bin bags taped to the carpet and this is probably the strangest thing in in the cupboard because it was a bedroom um there was no bed in there it was just just the cupboard mm-hmm. um in, in the cupboard was women's underwear on hangers <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> on hangers oh. that seems on hangers all right oh, wait, like <laughs> i'm trying so <laughs> 
is the waist around the top of the hanger so that like the pussy facing part is hanging straight down? No, they were like the crotch, like the little hangers, the like the wooden hangers Jesus. that have got the clips on them <laughs> that like you, you used to put pants on. Jesus Christ! Uh, wow. <laughs> uh, Duncan's like his, his indignancy <laughs> over my description is making me happy. No, no, I, <laughs> it's like uh, you I, went the long way to describe it. The pussy face. Yeah, no, it wasn't like fitted crotch. over the triangle. Right, it wasn't fitted over the triangle because that would be it. Just wouldn't work. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like, no, they're on, on the little clip hangers, like the little just like oh, just crossbar okay. the little clips on them, yeah. just on either end. Okay. Um, I mean, that's still yeah. super weird, but. That makes more <laughs> sense. I was thinking of like traditional hangers that you're like, you know, I got to put one end of the hanger through one leg and the other through the no, other leg. No, right. no. Um, and, and as I said, he was living by himself. Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah, of course you are. That's the kind of shit you get up to when you live alone. Yeah, is it like, <laughs> was it was it was our was, was there a stereo in the corner playing good goodbye horses or something? <laughs> like like a fucking large hey. freestanding mirror. Yeah, the bathroom's yeah, right good. down the hall. Uh also <laughs> would you fuck me? <laughs> yeah, if you could put the lotion on before you come back. <laughs> I'll swing in here. I'll swing in here. I don't I can't I can't remember and many times, if any podcasts have actually said this story on, because I, I tend to be fairly aware that you know, this person may listen to the show one day and hear how fucking revolted and disgusted I was by this. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the guitarist in my band that I was in years ago, um, the first time I uh, we went to to his house, his, um, not only was he would have been what in eighteen nineteen, his entire bedroom walls. Um, were covered in floor to ceiling um centerfolds from things like uh, Playboy and Hustler <laughs> and stuff like that. Just it was just like naked women everywhere. And in his uh, he had a glass bottle, a liter glass bottle of Southern Comfort filled with his own ejaculate. What? <laughs> <laughs> and that is a true story. That is not made up. Was he a hard Dorowski fan? <laughs> All I know is he. See now, I, I have a logistical question about that. Yep. Did he have a funnel? He, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> we, we never asked him how he did that. All I know is it had been in there. It had been in there so long that I had separated. Oh, oh wow! Oh. That is a detail I didn't need, but love. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it had separated into a pure like solution and a very kind of. Almost, um, how would you describe it? Paper mache paste sort of as well. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Oh. Like you um, ever, you ever, you ever tipped a lava lamp over? Uh, no, 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 I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I don't need any this, information. I, this I'm is just, the best show we've ever done. I, I am just picturing a dark version of the open of Look Who's Talking. <laughs> 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 Hey everybody, where are we going? Wait a second. I get it wrong. I get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, like, but, but, Bo, by the way, this guy is the same guy whose dad I have done impressions of on this show. Uh, the, okay. angry, the angry Scotsman. Yeah. That's him. Yeah. All right, so Duncan, do you have a less ball. disgusting question? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I've got one that's kind of practical, actually, and pertinent to the situation we're living in. Universal, this dropped on a, on Friday, both The Invisible Man and The Hunt on VOD. Um, mm. now both these movies are currently well in theatres, although theatres are closed. Do you think this will end the way the public consumes media in general, or do you think that cinemas will still thrive post-COVID-19? Put that to Derek first. Well, see, I live in a world where when I work during the night times, I usually go see movies during the day where it's a lot cheaper. Mm-hmm. And I usually go by myself. So I myself wouldn't be paying $20 for a rental mm-hmm. unless the whole family wanted to watch the movie, which my, a lot of my family members and other people that I usually watch, sometimes watch movies with, aren't really into horror movies like that. If it was yeah. like a different movie, maybe I wouldn't pay $20 unless other people wanted to watch it too. Mm-hmm. So I'd rather go see a theater because it was like a 
you know, like a $5 Tuesday or like a matinee show, I could go see it for $10 or something like that and still enjoy the movie and still, you know, you know, I wouldn't blind what rented for $20 if that makes sense by myself. But if it was other people that wanted to watch it, maybe, uh, I hope theaters do come back because I really do love the theater experience. It's crazy. I hope it's good to make money this way for them during this time period. I get it since these movies were in theaters and this shit happened. I hope all new movies don't come out like this though in the future. Cool. Same question to the witch. I, I kind of agree with Derek to a certain degree, but um, I feel that the cinema experience is unique and people crave it. Mm -hmm. Um, It's the same reason that we still have, drive-in theatres, um, you know, you have open theater, open air theatres, you know, pool theatre, you know, the fact of going to see a movie or a play or a musical or whatever with, with other people is something that adds to the value of it. And strangely enough, I actually think the fact that it's now been taken away from us, people will crave that. Mm-hmm. So yeah. when we get the opportunity for it to come back, People will go again. It might change. It might actually, I think, narrow down. The, like you, I don't think you're going to see the megaplexes, you know, the multiplex to a certain degree because it, the public is still going to be quite shy for a period of time. But I think, I think the cinema experience will still be important. Yeah, I agree too. You know, it's just. I, it's scary thinking that maybe all the companies will do this more in the future for newer releases too. That's what I'm kind of afraid of too, which, and, and it'll be like that movie Wally where we just never leave our beds and just mm-hmm. watch TV and never go out again, you know? I'm hoping, but, personally, I'm hoping what they do is they start, uh, I'm, like when cinemas like start reopening and things like that, like, see your large, large movies, these ones that I, I use Marvel as an example, but Star Wars is mm. another great example as well. These blockbusters that play for two months in the mm. cinema. What I'm kind of hoping is, right, they get their big opening week, they play for, what, three, four weeks, and then a VOD option is made available for them and, mm. you know, get them out of the cinema and let other movies play in cinemas because, like, and they do monopolise a large amount of cinema screen space in favor of just because of the companies behind them and the money they have, but get them out that way, you know, get, get them out that way. So, you know, people have that option if they want to revisit or rewatch two, three times, or if they want to get a group of friends around to watch it, they can do the The whole way we consume media, we were talking about this before you guys come on, um, is going to change. Uh, oh has yeah. To, has to, has to, has to yeah. change. Um, yeah. And this, this is one of the things where like, very much like how, like music companies, uh, like music labels were like, you know, online streaming's a bad thing. Yes, Napster maybe did it the wrong way. Uh, but, you know, it's, like, it's a bad thing. But now when you think about it, people are all walking around with Spotify, with iTunes and all the rest. They pay a sum of money and they get access to, you know, vast archives and catalogs of music that for what like, movies weirdly seem to even with netflix and amazon prime doing all the things that they're doing your hulus and your voodoos etc um i think there is still a very old-fashioned approach to how cinema is, is looked at and i don't think cinemas will ever go away very much leaning on the back of what the witch said like the fact you can still find drive like kind of drive out kind of cinema yeah driving cinemas yeah. yeah the fact that they still exist um, shows that as long as there is an appetite for people as consumers to pay into a product like that, those will exist. So cinema will always exist. I just think hmm. the way we consume movies and the, the release methodology that we have just now, if that changes, I'm not against that. <laughs> like, no. And, and the interesting thing is, is if they if they expedite the VOD option, you know, like mm-hmm. I said, it's week two or week three or even, you know, week four, it will actually reduce... Uh, the piracy level that goes with it. I think so. I think yeah. so. I think that'll be the big. I think you get you get them on VOD and you do away with a sh- kind of very an- antiquated, old fashioned release methodology of we'll stagger the release and it'll play in the states, and then three weeks later in the UK, and then five weeks later in Japan. And you know, th- these things to me are very old fashioned ways of doing things. Mm. Um, and you just release it everywhere at the same time, yeah. and then everyone release has it access. And, and- 
Yeah, everyone has it. They can go, if, you know, if they want to see week one, they go to the cinema. After that, it's VOD. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can still go see it in the cinema, but, it, you know, they, they pair it down after that. And there will be a portion of the populace that will only consume it via VOD because they don't want to leave their house. Yep. And that's 100% cool. But, you know, you see a Marvel movie in the cinema, it's fucking epic. You see mm-hmm. it at home, it's kind of cool, but not epic. Yeah. yeah. You know, and uh, another thing, uh, they they actually do kind of do that with like the lower like tier movies, like you know, like the IFC Midnight, yep. or like, you know, like the ND Circuit movies, where they will release yeah. them both on VOD in like limited theaters if you mm-hmm. want to see it in theaters. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a tried and tested release. I, my one always comes back to uh, when Ben Wheatley released a field in England and the UK it played um, cinemas. On the same night, you could buy it physically or rent it VOD all on the same day. Uh, and some people went to see it in the cinema because they wanted that cinema experience. Some people paid for it on VOD because they wanted to get a group of friends around and other people went out and bought the movie purely off the back of the director. So um, I think I, I think more options are not necessarily a bad thing. Choice is king when it comes to, yeah. to these sort of things. And I think if you stick yourself to one system, this is what I, we're talking about earlier on. If you are an airline service... And you've not put away money in case of a rainy day situation where people have contagions and can't fly, then you deserve to fall. <laughs> like, yeah. hard. Mm. Um, and it's the same with cinemas. If you've put, like, um, with, with, mo- with the movie industry, if you've put all your chips on the table based on people will be able to en masse congregate together in large cinemas, then that's the wrong, that's the wrong, <laughs> that's the wrong bet. Uh, Bo Ransdell, hmm. that was a big question I asked. Um, like, uh, a yeah. little bit deeper than I was expecting, but I love everything that happened. Do you have a question? I do have a question. Uh, mm-hmm. I will say about the, the theater thing, though, uh, if I may, that I have had nothing but awful experiences going to the, the movie theater over the past year. Uh, mm-hmm. Just every motherfucker taking a selfie of themselves as they sit down and, and texting through the movie and shit. So... I would love to see independent movie theaters thrive after this. And I would like to, those theaters that really cherish the the theater experience. Yeah. And mm. like, I'm very excited tonight. I haven't watched uh, Invisible Man yet, but I'm going to rent it tonight and watch it on mm-hmm. my giant ass screen in the basement. And that will be great. Uh, and if I could do that, uh, like, like which was saying, just give me the choice of interacting with, the the commoners um <laughs> but like i don't i i love going to the movies it's just as time has gone on it's become less and less of an enjoyable experience for me because of the people treating it like it's a public park as, yeah. a, as hmm. opposed to a theater that, and the, the the exception to that would be a place called the bell court which is the kind of the art house theater in nashville that i love I've never had a bad experience there, but I go to, you know, the Regal and it, it's kind of a shit show. Uh, yeah. 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 I was just going to say, Bo, on that, you know, that's probably one of my uh, reasons why I also go during the morning hours too, besides it's the only time I really get to go to the movies is it's less jam packed. There's only like, it depends on the movie too, but you know, it's usually lesser packed and it's usually a better crowd of people that are there when, yeah because all the kids are in school and shit during this time period I, I have had the opportunity to do some of those like tuesday like early morning matinees where it's like at 11 o'clock we're gonna be showing whatever the fuck and i do like those showings i agree with that i i think yeah. i think a great movie theater is often hamstrung by its its uh its patrons yeah um, but all right, so question. Let's start uh, with Derek again on this one. What sport is best played drunk? And this has nothing to do with the fact that you're from Boston. <laughs> uh, it's definitely not football. I know that the hard way. Uh, uh, I would say field hockey, street hockey. Oh, oh wow, yeah, that yeah, would be fun. Because I come from a family of hockey players. My cousin's actually an NHL player. Uh, oh wow. Yeah, wow. he plays for the Buffalo Sabres. Uh, so I used to play with them when they were kids and stuff. And, you know, uh, used to play, you know, it was fun, you know. And another worst sport ever to play is like just regular, like T ball, because then you just get pissed and you have a bat in your hand. So you never want to <laughs> piss off an aggressive drunk person with those. Tell them to come for, play for the Predators. We got, we got a good thing going here. 
does does sound like a, a, a group of it does actually, sound, the predators sound like a group of molesters? But it's actually funny you, you know, say that because he's originally drafted to the predators. Yeah, it, the, the predators. Yeah. Uh, they you know they're a contender. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the full name, Duncan, just to set your mind at ease, is the uh, school age predators. So it's not, <laughs> yeah. it's I'm not as bad say, as you're making it. Out. I'm kind of hoping that they're coached by Chris Hansen. <laughs> it's oh, <laughs> take a seat before they play. Um, yeah, sit your question. Russian ass down, goalie. Um, <laughs> anyway, which? which? Yeah. Uh, so, I oh, fucking hate sport. Um, volleyball. Let's let's play the stereotypes here. No, that's best played naked. Um, <laughs> I would have to say that actually, cricket is best played drunk because it's it's the only way to make it enjoyable. Oh, it's Otherwise, such a fucking boring sport. Thank God. Oh, it's so fucking boring. I love you uh, right now. <laughs> um, it, look, it is an Australian tradition to to get like fucking hammered on Christmas Day and then go out and play cricket in the yard with the small children and hurt them. <laughs> the, the only thing I think of cricket is Forrest Whitaker and the crying game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that's everything you need to know about cricket. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Duncan, I believe it is your final question. It is my final question. And I, uh, I tried to think long and hard about this one to make sure that I got the best possible question for the two. And I didn't know who was coming on. Bo did not tell me. He's flung this on me like the sexy... <laughs> like the semen in a jar. <laughs> I was about to say this, <laughs> the, 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 sexy, the sexy, glamorous STD that I did not want. That's Bo Ramsdale. <laughs> Surprise! You're positive. Um, yeah, Bo Simplex 3 is what I am. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise, it's positive. Uh, right, um, I, I, knowing both you gentlemen as well as I do, I know that we, we all have a fondness for particular types of cinema. Um, what I want you to do is tell me what your least type of cinema is, but what your favourite movie in that is. And this is where we read out your dirty secrets um, and recorded for prosperity and blackmail later on. Um, so <laughs> it started with The Witch. What is your least favourite film genre and what is your favourite movie within said genre? So I would have to say musical comedy is <laughs> oh, <dear>. probably <laughs> my, my, my least favourite genre of film. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, <laughs> I, I have a true love for Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Oh, such a good movie, dude. Uh, yeah, that's a solid answer. Uh, yes. What, what about you, Derek? What, what genre do you most hate and what movie do you most love within that genre? Mm. This is tough because, you know, I grew up with two sisters, so I have seen a lot of these movies. <laughs> And you know, <laughs> probably rom coms would be my answer. And you know, <laughs> this answer might be weird too. <laughs> I think I have to go with twenty. If you say four weddings and a funeral, I'm hanging up. All right, that's no. it. I'm fucking out. No, 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 no. no. My, my, you what? know, uh, I was gonna say uh, twenty seven dresses. It was a weird, odd choice. You know, <laughs> weird cast. Catherine Heigl. Mm -hmm. Who I usually don't like, but you know it was weird. It was, I actually could watch that one. You know, it was the one that me and my sisters watched that I could actually watch. You know, it had James Marston, you know, Cyclops himself. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. Mm. And then you know they do this weird musical number where they're shit face singing Benny and the Jets in the movie. And you know, Maylene Ackerman's all right to look at sometimes. Sure. Yeah, you, you've justified that. You've justified that. There we go. Uh, Bo Ryan's the same question for you. I um, <laughs> I, yeah, musical comedy for me as well. There's nothing I, yeah. I hate more in a movie than when people sing for no reason. Um, my exception to that rule would be Little Shop of Horrors, which I think is brilliant. It's the masterpiece. Oh. Yeah, original Little Shop or 80s Little Shop? Uh, 80s Little Shop, I'm hearing, uh, what's her name? It, not Ellen Page, uh, whatever her name is. El Ellen, Ellen Green. Ellen Green, when she yeah. does the whole, Doctor, Doctor, it is... Oh my god! I, the Steve Martin bit is hilarious. The Bill Murray oh. camera, the, front to back, it is. 
yeah. an amazing piece of work. And the alternate ending or the original ending is even better. Mm. Yes. Yeah. What, what about also, you, Duncan? Well, hang, on, hang, on, pants? hang on, Duncan. Yeah. Turn yeah, that shit around. Uh, I love all cinema, so um, liar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like rom coms, I'm not. I'm not a big. I'm not a big fan of rom coms, so I'm going to kind of side with, uh, with with Derek on that one. That being said, Ten Things I Hate About You is a fucking masterpiece. <laughs> I fucking love that movie more than I should. Uh, or uh, yeah, yeah, definitely with that. I don't think I've but, ever seen. I, that. I no, I can't honestly say I've never seen it. That's a yeah, pretty I good know. one too. I forgot about that one actually. There's like a, a weird part of me that likes a lot of kind of what would have movies that played on loop at the video store that I worked at for a couple of years and Ten yeah. Things I Hate About You was one of them. It's up there with something like uh, Ronnie and Michelle's High School Reunion, <laughs> which I fucking that love. Sounds that, like that's Stockholm great. Syndrome to me. You, you, know, you know what I always think about when I think about 10 things I hate about you? I want like an alternate universe where Larry Miller, the, the father in that movie, hangs mm-hmm. out with Red from that 70s show. Yeah, it'd be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised I'm surprised that The Witch has not seen 10 things I hate about you, considering your fucking heroes in that movie, and he's brilliant. That you know, old uh, Heath Ledger. Good. He's not my fucking hero. Um, How dare you! <laughs> you know what? He's dead. All right. He's fucking dead, mate. Take it back. Take it back. <laughs> oh, wow. The only good thing Heath Ledger ever did was the Joker. The rest of it, a I could piss on. Uh, yeah, I like a Knight's Tale. Off this, get off this pod. Get him off. <laughs> he was pretty good in Candy, even though it's an oppressive yeah. movie. Yeah. No. yeah it, uh, Brokeback Mountain. He's great in Brokeback Mountain. He yeah, he's he's not a very good... Hu- he was not a very good human, okay? <laughs> sure. Uh, no question. But, he, you know, look... Th- Roman Polanski seems like a real shitty person, but he's made some great movies. Yeah, I still, yeah, watch, sure. Rom- I still watch Ferris Bueller. Yeah, R- right. Roman Polanski. We, we should have all known everything we need to know about Roman Polanski after he played that season with the Predators. Yeah, <laughs> well, that, it was the team was named after him. How was Cameo yeah, sure, Caligula. I don't agree with his politics. Yeah. He's a hell of a guy. <laughs> all right, all right. Final question, and then uh, we can move on with our lives. <laughs> We can remember the greatest, the greatest segment that's ever been created out with a segment. Boy. Yeah, I, I know. I'm I'm very pleased. So the final question is, if you were sent into the past Terminator style, Ooh. naked, <laughs> no, nothing, <laughs> nothing on you, how would you prove you were from the future? Derek. Oh, boy. <laughs> I would just, I don't know. That's fucking a crazy question. Yeah, <laughs> I'd, be like, I'd probably be, I'd probably take a fucking Michael Bean approach and be like, "What year is it all crazy and shit?" While I'm stealing a homeless guy's outfit. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a Tuesday night for me. The worst thing you could do is like show somebody a picture of Trump and be like, "He is our president," because everybody would be like, "You're, a f- we're gonna lock you up. You're, you're going into the Twelve Monkeys Asylum for a while." Oh, plague of madness everywhere. Who's this Karen looking motherfucker? <laughs> um, would you any any answer at all, Derek? Any any? He told you he he, he would ask what year it was while shaking a homeless guy down for his clothes. Uh, all right, and I, I'm not sure I'm convinced by that, but uh, which I'll think of one. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, if you came up to me and and you were naked and I had a coat on, you were like, "What year is it?" And I need your coat. I would just call the police. I wouldn't be like, here is a visitor from the future. But then he would get arrested, interrogated, and that interrogation, he would tell them what year he was from. So yeah, I'd be arrested. interviewed by Lance Henriksen and Paul Winfield. That'd yeah, be pretty that'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. Mm, he, he'd tell a story about the guy fucking a poodle and setting fire to it. It'll be great. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. I'm, I'm on board now. Uh, <laughs> which, what about you? So I think the, the best way to do it, is, like you stack raving naked. Mm-hmm. Right, I think you, you you've got to strut it. You've you've just got to own the nudity, mm-hmm. and you walk straight into the closest place that is serving food. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, and you just you 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 walk up, you sit down, you ask for a cup of coffee and a piece of pie, and just let it go from there. Right now, people are going to react in one or two ways. They're either going to ignore it completely, or they're going to like if you've gone far enough back. Um, you know, people like try and dress you, treat you like the lunatic you are. On the pie mm. side, cup of coffee and pie. 
That, that's a good. That's a good point. I, I originally thought what he was going to say is you walk into a restaurant, put your dick in a hot dog bun, and ask for a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> is this a sandwich? Right. What are you from dogs. the future? <laughs> that would be my first question. Let's try bologna. Oh, that's yeah. real dumb. What is what is with your hot dog obsession, future man? <laughs> Clear, clearly, you come from a, a more elegant and, and elevated time where a penis and a hot dog bun is a sandwich. Tell, tell us more of the future. Yeah, in the, tell in us the more future, of your, there's your, statues of hot dogs. Your futuristic ways. Yes. <laughs> oh, Behold man. my manscape in a bun. <laughs> the, the sky net was destroyed by hot dogs. <laughs> um, <laughs> gentlemen. You have survived yes. the the first Duncan and Bo gauntlet. Yes, well done. Yeah, uh, we sincerely appreciate your presence. Uh, which, before you leave us, uh, what would you like to to pimp to the people? Oh, the things I would like to pimp. I have a brand new show, the Gangs of Hollywood podcast. It premiered this very day. Um, mm. It's very exciting. I've done a whole bunch of recordings. One with your co-host there. Um, about a fantastic Brian De Palma movie. And we are talking about gangs, gangsters, mobsters, Yakuza, everything that Hollywood has to bring us. It is massive fun. It'll come out every fortnight, as well as Witch versus the Doomsday Clock, which will come out in the alternate fortnight. Oh, I love a fortnight. Mm. There you go. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks oh, very much. Podcast, folks. Uh, t- yeah, our, our pleasure. Derek, before we get rid of you, what uh, what would you like the other uh, people listening to know where to find you? Jesus. Oh, Duncan. It's a long way to get to that question. I, it's going to be a long answer because there's Duncan knows. <laughs> Derek's got like a hundred shows. <laughs> no, I got five. I got five. I'll do it easy. I'll do it easy. I'll do it fast. Of course, on Legion podcast, I do a Kill the Cast present show, Underwater Kaiju from outer space where we're actually coming back soon a new episode soon so look out for that and also i am a host of many shows on uh kind of the sister network of a uh, legion uh, horophilia.com their network where i do multiple shows including uh cinema attack and its sister show celluloid dissections uh their hair podcast which is a brand new show that i just started three episodes in and finally i am the third co-host of Normal Room in Hell. Check all those shows out. Really fun stuff. Different genres, different stuff. I talk about everything. I love movies. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, again, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, we are going to leave you now so that Duncan and I can face each other in a question ga- gauntlet. Uh, but uh, but we really appreciate oh it. This thank you. Fun. Thank you. This is an honor because, you know, I recorded with uh, Witch and duncan beforehand and this is the first time i ever recorded with you bo is honor to record with you oh man my, my pleasure we'll we'll have to come up with a reason to do something stupid in the in the not too distant future sounds good man well we're at home everyone's at home you've got plenty of time sure sure <laughs> uh all right guys take care we'll talk to you soon peace all right, all right bye bye all right duncan mm-hmm. it is just you and i again <laughs> no, i think we're alone now Every single gene is a hand-me-down. Oh, I'm sorry. That's I think I'm a clone now <laughs> by Weird Al. Uh, Duncan. Yes. Let us uh, let us begin our own gauntlet. Uh, unlike the previous segment, there will be no answers, only questions. <laughs> uh, I want to give a bit of context for this. There's a video flying around. Just that's been flying around for a while. With doing introductions to is it Ripley's Believe It or Not or something. Like- yeah, it, yes, it's a like a fact or fiction kind of show that Jonathan Frakes hosts. Yeah, and he obviously, before every segment, would ask a question. And I suppose in the context of the show, they make sense, but taken out of the context of the show and played back to back, there's some weird fucking questions that Jonathan Frakes is asking. And he's so happy when he does it. So I'd say to Bo, you know what, we should do this. We should just come up with 10 questions, Bo. I know you said you had 16 10 yeah i've got always. i've pared it down to my favorite 10 excellent and we're going to go back to back here we're going to see how long we can last because i've got a feeling that some of these are going to cut us up all right oh uh would you like me to begin duncan please do all right i'll i'll start with uh when did you last check your basement 
Oh, see, that's... <laughs> um, have you ever considered that maybe you were the second gunman on the grassy knoll? Where are all your hats? Have you ever watched The Shining in reverse? If you were arrested, what would people assume you had done before hearing the charge of buggery? <laughs> ever drank a coffee that made you think of the Hitler bunker scene in Dimfo? When did you know animals were sexy? <laughs> That hit me just right. <laughs> oh, you ever read a newspaper in the voice of Chris Tucker? <laughs> <laughs> Pineapple on a pizza. Bad topping or worse topping? Have you ever tried to draw a pentagram in quicksand? If you were a mad scientist, what would be your first experiment and why is it a third penis? <laughs> This one links up pretty good with it. Lost a testicle while playing pocket billiards. <laughs> <laughs> Trash bin or garbage can? Oh, son of a bitch. Uh-huh. Uh, have you ever questioned your life choices after binge watching a TV show you know was going to be terrible and prove right in the final credits? What's the weirdest place you've ever peed? Have you ever ate a truck stop burrito that didn't give you cancer of the ass? How many kids have you seen in your trash? <laughs> Has your ejaculate ever resembled a pagan deity? <laughs> Unicorns, pest or peril? Have you ever shat so hard that your asshole became a black hole connection to an alternative universe where Uber drivers were actually part of the Japanese feudal system of samurai class? I know we're not supposed to answer, but yes. <laughs> I have as well. It happened this morning. <laughs> All right, and that is our newest segment. Questions from beyond. Oh, we need to do this every show. We it's, need to do- <laughs> I like everything that's been happening here. Duncan. <laughs> yes, Bo. Uh, oh. Let us bring this in uh, to a landing. And by landing, I mean another 30 to 40 minutes of nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> As we discuss recent watches in a segment we're calling Recent Watches. How did they come up with the name? I, I know. know. I've just got to remember to put the ticking sound in here. You know, recent <laughs> watches. Uh, Duncan, you and I like to watch movies. Uh, this has been, uh, yeah, this has been widely recognized as historical fact. Yeah. So let's let's talk about some movies. What we've been watching. Um, I'll I'll throw a couple at you. Uh, real quick. Uh, I saw that rabid remake. Oh, <laughs> um, how is that? Not very good. <laughs> It's a shocking revelation on Duncan and Bo Comes Correct. Yeah. Uh, 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 an ill-timed remake of a classic movie by two directors that are questionable of talent, turns out to be mediocre. News at 10. Yeah, and th- I think that's kind of the headline, is that it's it's not the worst thing you ever saw, but, I mean, it's certainly no Cronenberg film. Um, yeah, you're, you're taking a master of horror and you are remaking his movie. Right, so this better be the best interpretation ever or what's the point yeah and it turns out it was not mm. um in, in in a similar vein i'm just gonna throw these back to back i also saw the movie polaroid the much delayed movie polaroid <laughs> oh dear yeah or, or as i like to call it not quite uh, not quite sure not quite final destination not quite 1999 who made this movie <laughs> It, the end of this movie is such utter nonsense <laughs> of all of a sudden there's a spooky demon that's mm-hmm. that's trying to kill him. It Polaroid is fucking stupid. It is <laughs> it is equal parts dumb and unentertaining. Mm-hmm. It is a movie that dares you to finish it. <laughs> I saw it last October as part of that 31 of October thing I did. And I was just like, I don't know what it is like in the last two three years there's just an influx of like lesser versions of final destination that appear to have made their way out there um and i I don't know why that is like i genuinely don't know um but between that movie and um like the hints that like it really wants to emulate kind of early 2000 j horror as well Mm. but doesn't have a clue how to do any of it so just it just kind of stumbles around in the dark. Much like someone that, that would stumble if the flash from a Polaroid had blinded them temporarily. 
Yes, it is. <laughs> it's real dumb. But uh, uh, hit me with something on your side of things. So, yeah, since we last spoke, I went out to Glasgow Fright Fest, mm-hmm. which was a surprisingly strong year for Glasgow like quite a few Duff movies in there but I thought it landed really really well so I'll throw just a a very quick recap of some movies that I think should be on your radar of course Synchronic should be on your radar it's a new movie by the duo behind um, The Endless Resolution Spring it's really really fucking good like once again them just playing with time space it's weirdly their most commercial movie in that I could see it playing in cinemas comfortably Uh, so okay yeah, if you get a chance, check it out. Uh, I would say The Mortuary Collection, uh, which is directed by a guy called Ryan Spindell. It's an anthology. Yep, I, that but, has uh, been well on my radar. I've heard nothing but great things about that. It's fucking brilliant. I mean, the, the production value is amazing. And the Crypt Keeper in this one, or Mortuary owner in this one, is played by Clancy Brown. So, yeah, I, ever there was a time to fucking what he's brilliant in it yeah. as well. So fucking good. Um, I will also throw on your radar of things to, you know, definitely check out. It, I mean, as if I need to promote this one, it's amazing. It's my favorite horror movie of the year. Saint Maud mm-hmm. is legit amazing. Like really fucking good. Like effortlessly good. But one that I know for a fact that you will love to see Boran still, and it will hit your funny bone in all the right places. It is a rom zom com. Uh, of sorts Mm -hmm. uh, from South Korea and it's called Zombie on Sale aka The Odd Family Zombie on Sale it is brilliant it is about a zombie that's created through a medical kind of experiment who is kind of brought in by this family and they find out that the the zombie bite uh, temporarily uh, causes people to de-age so hmm. like cocoon style, <laughs> like so, um, so the the site that, that what they'll do is they'll create a business off the back of this uh, and kind of de-age all the the people in the town. The only problem is th- that de-aging effect is the precursor to what happens when zombies bite you, and then all manner of hilarity ensues. It's, it's fucking brilliant. I mean, every comic beat is absolutely amazing, and it would pair so well, like so so well, um, with one cut of the dead. Huh. That, okay. That's a double bill that would be they're kind of very similar in sense of humor, very similar in tone. And it's it, once again another shining example of why South Korean cinema is just better than everyone else's, <laughs> really. So Can I th- can I throw in uh another South Korean movie that Please do. you've probably already seen, but uh if you if you haven't, um a film called Gonjiam uh Haunted Asylum. It's brilliant, the film footage one. Yes, it is a yes. fantastic film footage movie. Movie, um that you can you can now actually see on streaming and mm. um it is yeah it, it, it's up there as far as recent found footage movies with things like the first grave encounters and afflicted as far yes. as just like yeah, yeah. this is legitimately a found footage movie worth your time yeah i saw it, i think i did it two years ago from uh 31 of october mm-hmm. and i got a, a press screener for it and absolutely loved it thought it was brilliant yeah yeah, uh, give me something else. Um, let's swing into the <laughs> what were they thinking category. That fantasy island movie is hot garbage. I had also heard that. <laughs> <laughs> hot fucking garbage. That is a movie that feels like 75 people wrote it. <laughs> really? Oh, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess of a movie. And another one which totally thinks that it's Final Destination at some point like this, this director dude that did this movie. What's his name again? Because he did um, director. His name is Jeff Wadlow. His previous movie for Blumhouse was Truth or Dare, which also felt like a kind of cheap knockoff of Final Destination. Yeah, um, it was kind of yeah, notoriously terrible as well. It wasn't very good, and this one is on a feels like a bigger budget, but equally not as good. It's ultimate. Is I you? I can't wait for you to watch it because it's ultimate reveal as to the motivation of it. Like devolves as it goes through the original motivation that you think is is carrying out the things that are happening on the island is relatively lofty and kind of vendetta based. And then there's about two or three reveals down to who is really behind it all at the end. And when we reach the reveal at the very end, it is the dumbest fucking thing I've seen in a movie. In quite some time. Like, huh. quite some time. So, yeah, it's not good at all. 
Um, <laughs> speaking of not good at all, Duncan. <laughs> Uh, I watched uh, a little movie called uh, Psycho Shark, a.k.a. Jaws in Japan. Of course you did. And of course you did. <laughs> look, I just got to put it on record. It is one of the most confusing, boring pieces. <laughs> like, I watch a lot of Asian horror movies because that's just my jam. Mm -hmm. But this was one where I was like, oh, my God, nothing is happening in this. And then when it finally happens, there's a giant... CGI shark that shows up at the end of the movie that is apparently some kind of god that some people at this resort are sacrificing girls to. Oh, nice. Perhaps. <laughs> like, I am filling in a lot of blanks that the movie doesn't bother to. <laughs> but it is it is almost worth watching the last ten minutes for the utter nonsense of it. Mm. But there's an hour ten before that that is <laughs> fucking unbearable. It is, it, like, if I hadn't been watching, it was a, sort of a community viewing that uh, I do uh, periodically, where it's just like, hey, let's all get together and watch this movie. And I kind of went into it sight unseen, because hearing a movie called Jaws in Japan had me mm -hmm. all excited. Of course it did. And there is no Jaws. There is very little Japan, quite frankly. It's basically just one beach where some girls cavort in bikinis for a while, and then guys watch them. Jaws takes Manhattan. It, uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. It's it's that level of disappointment and shittiness of like, oh god, this could have been good and it's not at all. Um, but uh, help me, Duncan. Sh tell me something else that you've seen. Uh, the color out of space. Oh, I haven't you, seen that yet. Rich just is real fucking I know. good. I know. I, real, I'm, real good. I'm sleeping on it. I know. Um, it's. I mean, you you need to be in the right frame of mind for it. This is the return of Richard Stanley, his first movie in close to thirty years, and it's got Nick Cage. It's you know produced by Spectre Vision, based on Lovecraft, and there is all manner of nods to um, thing oh, Lovecraft adaptations, specifically things like um, From Beyond. Um, but there are like huge nods to movies like The Thing. I mean, some of the visual effects are right from the thing. And as a weird sense of humor that you can only get from having Nick Cage in your lead in your movie. Um, but it is, I mean, like he toured the force of the senses. Like it is like nonstop. Um, don't go in thinking it's Mandy because it's a different director, different sort of movie. But when it finishes, you will feel drained. <laughs> it's just a nonstop assault of color noise, sound, and Nick Cage. Uh, it's, it's really, really, really good, and I'm very interested to see what uh, Stanley does next, because he signed up for this Lovecraft trilogy. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they, they keep giving this guy money. It, it's, it's so interesting to see a guy who has not done anything for so long come back and it feel like he's not missed a beat at all. Like Even just a little bit, he, he's come back. If anything, he's come back at the exact for a director of his stature so great um uh, speaking of indie horror movies i finally caught up to one called dead ant oh i saw that last year at fright face it's that's a real charming movie did, did you, you I, I think i told you about it at the time seeing hawks in it yeah like, ah! he, yes <laughs> i could call indeed and uh i'll have to find that sound effect but yeah, he's he's very funny in it. Um, I I think that generally it's one of those movies that is very low budget. Clearly, oh, God yeah, but does everything it can with the budget it has. I am not someone who would ordinarily say, you know, who's pretty good in it? Tom Arnold. Tom Arnold is really good in it. He's very very, very funny. funny. Yeah. Uh, so say, what's his face? Busey. Um, Jake Busey is really funny in it as well, and. Yeah. There's uh there's an actor in it and let me look up his name real quick but it's, it's sort of the lead character mm -hmm. uh Danny Woodburn I think is the guy yeah um and he is no Danny Woodburn's the uh the short fella um who is this guy <laughs> not her not him not him um him. yeah I can't believe I can't find this guy's <laughs> is this it yeah Reese Coiro. <laughs> Um, he, he's, he's, <laughs> but he's essentially the main character the 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 guy um 
who's the guitarist, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he's kind of great in the movie. And, like, all the performances are are sort of better than the movie itself. Mm -hmm. But it's a it's a fun film. It, it like I said, it it could have very easily been a sci fi channel. Oh God, yeah, away the, movie. Yeah, the effects are sci fi level channel. Yes, level. yes, but it, it is way more clever than that, and and it ends in this really like kind of buoyant moment mm -hmm. where you know as the band comes together and all that. It's just one of those movies that's like this is good mm -hmm. and. I didn't expect it to be as as good as it was. Uh, directed by a guy named Ron Carlson, who I have to say did uh, a movie called Lifeblood that sounds okay. interesting. Uh, Lifeblood, aka Sunset Vampires, <laughs> that I will a hundred percent watch at some. Point. Also, sounds like the the make of a Yankee Candle. <laughs> like you know what sure. I mean? Yeah. What, what, what delicious smell in your house is Sunset Vampires by Yankee Candle. Yeah. Oh, you know, what is, is that? Is, is that laundry? No, no, no. That's Sunset Vampire. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll also throw in very quickly a couple of uh, a couple of favorites that I know we've both seen. Uh, oh, yeah. I, like I rewatched Demon Wind. Oh, be, God. Be, because how do you not? <laughs> That's so good. Um, I watched... <laughs> Uh, uh, Amityville 3D. Uh, cause I've I, never seen that. Have you not? It, it's, no. you should. It is, despite the 3D gimmick, it's not a bad Amityville movie. And it's certainly the best Amityville movie since the original ones. Yeah. So yeah, like Amityville one, two, and three, I can all kind of recommend for different reasons. And then everything after that's kind of garbage. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyway, that saw that. Uh, 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 finally, uh, like rewatched The Exorcist and Return of the Living Dead as some comfort food. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the subspecies I watched again for no good reason. <laughs> I I have a weird fondness for that movie, but uh, uh, but one one new one I will mention. I I finally saw the possession of Michael King. Oh, all right, yeah, that was a couple of years ago. It was a couple of years ago. I will say I thought. Uh, that was an okay movie. Yeah, but I don't really care for the lead performance very much. I would agree with that hundred percent. And then the end is just straight up The Exorcist. Yes. <laughs> and I was like, well, this had me for a little while until it just turned into a bunch of familiar stuff. And also, I just thought the the lead performance was real hammy. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, what about you? G give me a, give me a couple of, of items from your list. Right, let's let's close it down then. Right, so um, I checked out Daniel isn't real, uh -huh. um, which is real fucking good. Like really, really, really good. Much better than you would expect. Um, it has as its central cast as well, uh, Patrick Schwarzenegger, son of Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Miles Robbins, son of Tim Robbins, in the the main role, the main roles, and both of them do a great job. It's like a really malicious um, drop dead Fred. <laughs> um, like really, really, really well done. Takes a, a nice dark turn that I really enjoyed, but um, is is well worth your time for sure. I saw the new um, Elijah Wood movie, Come to Daddy. Uh, check that one out. Don't sleep on that one. That is a ton of kind of weirdly dark comedic fun, um, and has a great cast as well. Elijah Wood, Stephen McHattie. Uh, you've even got Michael Smiley from a lot of the Ben Wheatley movies. Plays an incredible role in it. Very much worth your time as well. It's about a uh, kind of kid, kind of hipster kid who goes to stay with his estranged dad out of the blue and realizes very quickly that his estranged dad is not uh, what he imagined him to be, and also might not be the person that he says he is. So, and it, it's it's really good. Elijah Wood. There's something about him now, the fact he's doing all that Spectre Vision stuff and the fact he really consistently is doing genre stuff makes me warm more and more to him as time goes on. Um, and he, he delivers the goods on that one, so that's definitely worth checking your uh, checking out. Um, checked out The Boy 2. Skip that one. That one is a waste of space. <laughs> yeah, I mean, The Boy 1 wasn't a, what oh, you this would one, call a, a crowd yeah, pleaser. 
And this is like my new stance on things is that like certain sequels nowadays are are coming out worse to make you reevaluate and appreciate the first installment better. Um because it really did. I thought at the end of it, I was like, maybe the first one wasn't all that bad, because this one's real. Um, so yeah, it wasn't very good. And on a nostalgia wave of movies that I have seen before that I have rewatched recently, Kingdom of the Spiders, by God, do oh, I love that movie. It's so great, good. Front to back, great movie. Yeah. Like just genuinely great movie. Um, The Untouchables, which I may or may not have done for um a certain uh, guest that we just had on the show's new show. Uh, which oh man, what a movie! Just continues to like be like a, an absolute joy to watch, like an easy movie to watch, just like wall to wall great performances. Sightseers, the Ben Wheatley movie, which once again just is a an absolute tour de force of dark comedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the last one I want to talk about is a movie which just when you thought a movie like a genre couldn't produce a really dumb movie. You then sit down and watch a movie called Anderson Falls, which was the closing movie at Fright Fest this year, directed by Julianne Seri, with a relatively good cast. You've got Sean Ashmore in the lead role, Lynn Shi, and Gary Cole. <laughs> so okay, and what a, what is it called again? It is called Anderson Falls. Let me give you the synopsis. After his wife's suicide, Detective Jeff. A- becomes convinced that she has been murdered. Obsessed with the investigation, he finds that his wife was the victim of a team of a father and son serial killer uh, and sets out to stop them. Oh, okay. I read that to you. You're like, this sounds good. Yeah, it sounds a little bit like uh, I Saw the Devil, which is a fantastic movie. It does, doesn't it? That is not... This is like... like, This could have been a Columbo episode, but like on the season that no one watched. (laughs) <laughs> like, oh no that fucking dumb right so you know who the killers are right from the start doesn't hide that so which i'm not against and then we're kind of playing catch up as we watch sean ashmore go through various stages of unshavenness to prove that this has really shook him up where lynn she plays his mother who's now looking after his you know kid his wife's died and she just every time the screen the camera's on him she's just like you're a bad father spend time with your son this i legit legitimately cannot stress this enough to you right now this movie one doesn't like women at all uh, but not only does it not like women the way that sean ashmore gets into the head of the serial killer is by taking pictures of murdered women putting them on a wall writing in red ink on them, I hate you, and then screaming at them, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, for a day. And then when his partner arrives, he says, I'm finally in the mind of the killer. Ugh. This, I'm just scanning the reviews of this. (laughs) My favorite is, this film is a knob. (laughs) And here's, to your point, one of the reviews is, at one point, a man shouts, I hate you, at a printed out photo. This had me laughing way too much and for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, yeah this, that's how he gets into This is psychopathology handled in Anderson Falls. As a cop just screams at a photo, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And then his partner comes and he's like, I'm finally in the mind of the killer. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I know how the killer thinks. It is. And then, like, there's a lot of things that happen in it. And then at the end, uh, just a slight minor spoiler, uh, the end sequence of them driving off into the sunset is not merited, not warranted, and would not happen. (laughs) Like, uh, like on the lead up to everything that happens beforehand, uh, this guy's got some explaining to do. Yeah, if you hate yourself, watch this movie. Uh. Um, If you... Uh, you, you will watch it. I know because yeah. I sold it to you. You've now read those reviews and you're like a bad movie. Um, but yeah, if you ever do see it, um, we, we, we need to we need to discuss it. And we, that is all I have to say about movies. All right. I have one more uh, because I just want to tell you uh, that I feel foolish for not having seen it until now. <laughs> but I finally uh, sat down with Knives Out. Oh, how good is Knives Out? And it is, it's my favorite movie. Aside from Parasite, it's my favorite thing that I've seen this year. It's uh, f- like, Knives Out is front to back. Ju- like, there's a murder mystery. <laughs> like, like, Anderson Falls, terrible example of a murder mystery. Knives Out, picture perfect example. In fact, you know what? Like, the balls on Ryan Johnson, the fucking balls of this guy, makes his own version of an Agatha Christie 
movie, essentially, a Poirot-style yeah. movie in the same time period that Sir Kenneth Branagh is doing resurrected versions of Poirot movies and did it better. Well, yeah. Uh, first of all, Benoit Blanc is... is the greatest character ever. <laughs> he is such a good detective character. And the thing... Th- this is a mild spoiler for about the first 15 minutes of the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe 20. Let's be real. But... Mm-hmm. Uh, the fact that you know way more than Daniel Craig's character does for most of the movie until you yep. don't. Yes. Um, and that the prime suspect of the film is someone who is physically incapable of lying. Yes. <laughs> is so good, man. It's just such a so clever smart. little twist. Yeah, it's such yeah. a clever little twist on the, the genre. It's, let's put it this way. Murder mysteries are, as a like bona fide aficionado of murder mystery movies, that's essentially what Jallos are, and Jallos are like my favourite subgenre in cinema. I love a murder mystery. Yeah. Like, I, I really, really do. Always have since I was a kid. Agatha Christie, La Poirot, and Miss Marple, all that shit growing up. You know, that that's that's my... In a lot of respects, that is, that's comfort for me. It's comfort food for me. To see a modern version of it that is done on the screen where the ending completely made sense and I didn't get before it happened. Like, the reveal, like, the way it all played out was in such a way where I was like, oh, that's really rather clever. Um, the cast is a A-list cast. Yes. And they're all having a fucking ball. Like, every single one of them is doing, no one's chewing scenery here in a way which doesn't feel merited for the role. The, the repetition of... You know, I wanted you to be at the funeral, but I was outvoted. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's, man, it it is again. It's just one of those things that's so well realized yeah. that as you're watching it, there's there's a point in that movie, and I think it's about the time that Daniel Craig was like, you know, I say I need you to help me, Martha. <laughs> yeah, he's the best Foghorn Leghorn voice. It's it's very Foghorn Leghorn. <laughs> I love it. I yeah, I do too. Like I'm not saying that as a criticism. It is wonderful. But when he, <laughs> when you know, as a viewer that she is responsible for the death of Christopher Plummer. Again, I'm not giving anything away. This is early goings. Yep. And he basically says, I need you to help me to get to the bottom of this because of your innate ability not to lie. Mm -hmm. And that's the point where I stopped trying to second guess the movie. I just sat back and I was like, you know what? I'm in the hands of a great filmmaker. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to let this go. I'm just going to enjoy this ride. And when I got to the end of it and you get the full reveal of here is everything that happened. Um, and, you know, it's a one plus one plus one plus one. Well, um, that's okay. See, there are moments in this that are right from Clue. Yes, but wonderfully so. Like It's like Ryan Johnson had seen every murder mystery movie ever. <laughs> and just took all the best parts of them. But she may have known the director. He may have. He and if know. he didn't, his wife certainly has. Or, you know, what's her name? <laughs> Karina Longworth, who does that. Yeah, yeah. You must remember this show. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it it is. It's very classical, but it's got a modern sensibility. Mm-hmm. And the delivery of Chris Evans' line at the end of the movie... Mm-hmm. And I will say no more about it. He just, there's one line he has uh, at at the conclusion. He's kind of funny throughout the movie. He's really good in it. Like, but really good. In it. He has a one word line at, at the end of this film that is the biggest laugh I've had all year. Mm-hmm. It is so funny. Um, yeah, he's great in it. Uh, Anna the who plays Marta, who's yeah. in the new Bond movie, she's incredible in it. Uh, Daniel Craig, across, of course. Ac- across the board, like um, like when you're talking about Jamie Lee Curtis, um, Michael Shannon in a part that could have gone to anybody, <laughs> anyone, anyone. Like it's like it's the most un Michael Shannon role you would ever imagine on a script, and he's br- Don Johnson. Oh, like yeah, Don, Don Johnson Johnson's is like so a good. fine fucking wine man. Everything that guy has done um, in the last like five years, I just think is like. Brilliant. He's a great fucking actor. There is a there is a moment where he's uh it, it's like the the dinner after Christopher Plummer has died or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's like the whole family is sitting around and Don Johnson gets into a very like Trumpian kind of speech yep. about Marta and he's like, Come here, come here, Marta. I want to hear your p- point of view. 
and then never asks her a question. She just stands no. there silently. <laughs> and then before she leaves, he hands her his empty plate. Yeah. It is one of those like little touches that nobody comments on it. She doesn't talk about it later or anything. It's just this little moment where you know everything you need to know about Don Johnson and mm-hmm. how he feels about her. Mm-hmm. It is fucking like Ryan Johnson is such a good director. If anyone like this is the, like at this stage, right? I know he took some heat for that Star Wars mo- movie, which I still think everyone's fucking wrong on. I thought that Star Wars movie was great. Um, but like he's like he literally like where where some people would be like oh you know I need to shy away from the public arena he was like all right I'll just go and make a I'll just go make this little movie here and it made a fucking ton of yeah. money it made so, so and, much and he's money. doing another and I could not yeah. be happier about the further adventures of Benoit Blanc oh yeah you could give me one of them every couple of years it's essentially what Kenneth Branagh is doing now because you're about to get another uh, Poirot movie in the next. Well, I think it's this year, maybe. Yeah, Death on the maybe Nile. Maybe delayed slightly. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe delayed to next year. But that's basically what he's doing now. And I would happily live in a world where Ryan Johnson, every two, three years, does, does another uh, Benoit Blanc movie. I, w- I would happily watch him. As long as they're written like that, I think, yeah, it, it, it's something so much fun to watch. Um, and yeah, I, I, I've only seen it once, but I've, I've got the 4K... Blu-ray coming out. I can't wait. To it's beautifully shot as well. It's mm-hmm. like really, really, really done. That classical style um, of, of kind of shooting thrillers. It's just brilliant and wickedly funny. Like, wickedly funny. Um, yeah, brilliant movie. Yeah. So, uh, big takeaways. Uh, if you haven't seen it, by, by God, watch The Knives Out. And uh, Daniel Isn't Real uh, is, is on my short list. Um, yeah. I, I expect this weekend I'm going to do a shit ton of movie watching, <laughs> which is going to include um, Invisible Man, Color Out of Space. Probably I might go ahead and check out Daniel Isn't Real. Um, I, w- weirdly, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit down and watch Threads again. Oh, I've been dear God, <laughs> I've been hit yourself. <laughs> I've just been thinking about it a lot lately. Where am I? Don't, yeah, don't I, what you mean? <laughs> it's it, one of those. Like I haven't seen. I've I've only seen it once, and it fucked me up. Oh yeah. And now I'm just like you know, it's been long enough, and given the state of the world, I've just naturally drawn. Like I watched Outbreak and Contagion and shit like that recently because I'm just morbid. Which, by the way, Contagion's a f- great fucking movie. Mm-hmm. Outbreak is not. No, um, Outbreak did not age well. No. <laughs> No, but I think I'm gonna. Uh, I'm probably gonna kick back and watch the platform, which just hit Netflix, and um, eh, maybe the hunt. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what what's on my plate. You got anything that you're excited about, Sam? So yeah, we're gonna rent the hunt tonight. Um, so that's that's in the the kind of crosshair, the immediate crosshairs anyway. That um, director's cut of uh, Doctor Sleep also oh, came in the so post this good. week. So I'm kind of hoping that that might be some tomorrow viewing as well. Um, I just started uh, Hunters, the net, the Amazon Prime Nazi hunting thing with a uh, Al Pacino. Yeah, I I got about three episodes into that, and I was like, I don't think I like this. Right. So like, I I know I knew nothing about it, and I started watching the first episode, and the first episode completely hooked me. I, I it was not what I was expecting at all. Uh, so much so that I actually stopped watching it so I could say to my wife, actually, you need to watch this with me. Um, we're still working our way through Picard, which has been a pure joy. <laughs> like, so, so good. I, I really, really, really enjoy it. It's just way, it, it is literally just waves and waves of nostalgia, though, um, for, for a, an old next generation fan. Uh, so I've been enjoying that. I've got some Netflix docs queued up as well that I'm really, that second season of that Dirty Money dropped. Mm-hmm. In the last week, I really, I really want to get on that. Um, out with that, just a lot of stuff for podcasting. Sure. So. Oh, and also, second season of Kingdom dropped, which the See, first I've season of Kingdom is really good. I never got into that, so it's on the list. But I've, I've heard nothing but great things it's, about that as well. It's, it's fucking great. Um, uh, you know, let me one other on dis or honorable mention before we get out of here. Speaking of my Asian movie watching. I saw one called, uh, is it Splatter Naked Blood? Of course you did. Naked Splatter Blood? Blood Naked 
splatter, something like that. Well, those three words are in the title. Yeah. <laughs> and it is a weirdly Cronenbergian movie about uh, a woman who is conducting experiments in, in pain mm-hmm. and her weirdo kid adjusts the formula to heighten the pleasure response to pain. Oh, right. And as a result, the three women in this study begin to very, very quickly associate pleasure and pain as one thing. Mm -hmm. And it becomes, like I said, kind of Cronenbergian of these women just carving themselves up in ecstasy. And it's, it doesn't land as well as a Cronenberg movie. Like it, it has a point to make, but it's not as clear as it needs to be. Mm-hmm. But there is shit dunking in this movie that I have never seen in another film and, and never expect to see again. So <laughs> if you're one of those people that's like, what is the weirdest movie I could watch right now? Uh, n- splatter naked blood, I think is the name of it. Or like I said, it could be naked splatter blood. It doesn't matter. Those three words, search those three words and you will find this movie. And it is uh, it is a deeply strange and and weird movie that I have not been able to stop thinking about since I saw it. Don't put it on the list. I mean, don't, but do. <laughs> <laughs> I would. It, it's one of those that you're going to come back and you're going to be like fucking gun woman, Bo. Fucking yeah. <laughs> gun woman. Um. In the meantime, folks, uh, look. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be back in a month to do it again, uh, Duncan. Yes. Where can people find you in the meantime? Yes, you can check me out on Podcast Under the Stairs. Um, it's anywhere you listen to podcasts or visit the website Teaputzcast or the Facebook page facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Teaputzcast. And like we said at the start of the show, take care wherever you are. And if you need anything, you know where we are on the social medias, reach out. And hopefully this episode a smile and a bit of levity to your day. Uh, couldn't couldn't be better said, Duncan. Uh, check out legionpodcasts.com for more. Uh, you can also find us uh, on Twitter at Legion Podcasts, uh, as well as on Facebook. So uh, until then, uh, we'll see you in a month. Say goodnight, Duncan. Goodnight. Duncan. Ah.